Well, I'm Eric Subring. I work with uh, WOJB Radio. Thank you so much for coming. We're glad you got the word out. Um, a lot of folks involved tonight. You're going to meet some of them. I want to also thank Paul Demain, News from Indian Country, who is uh, web streaming this live on Indian Country TV. And <laughs> folks are likely looking at this up in uh, Cable, at the Cable Natural History Museum as well. And if... Uh, and, and we're just delighted to be partnered with all these wonderful people. It was almost 30 years ago that I met this man. This man is Paul Thompson. He was then, yeah, uh, he was then skiing to end hunger. And then a decade or 15 years later, he was one of the people that Lynn Larson and others brought together to ski for global cooling. And that was the last time that Bill McKibben was here. But let's move things over and let uh, turn this over to Paul Thompson of Cool Planet Skiers and... 350.org and all. How about a big hand for Jason and Eric? Yeah. The blinding lights of the stage. So, uh, it, Berkey weekend's here and there's snow. <laughs> Last year coming up, I was in Spooner, no snow. And I thought, I've heard there's snow, and then Hayward, and then Cable. And isn't winter the best season of all? <laughs> I grew up in Minneapolis playing hockey, skating, shoveling, seeing snow piles like this. And so when we thought about Bill McKibben coming back for his second Berkey, Wave 2 classic skier, we thought we should come up with a theme that represented the work that he's doing globally, to awaken people to the possibility of a world that has a future for our children and to celebrate what it is that we love. And as Bill so beautifully puts, it's the season without friction. And having no friction makes even tall, awkward people such as myself able to move through the hills slowly but get to the finish line 32 times, 32. <laughs> So I don't know if you can see this, but our, th our, our activity for you tonight is to talk about what it is that you love about winter. So is my lovely assistant out there? Mindy, my partner and helper, going back to the back row with Lynn Larson, the founder of Skiers for Global Cooling. We're going to have them read, some, keep going back, back. Lynn, raise your hand. I can't either. Could we have the house lights up a little bit, please? House lights, house lights up. So here we go. We're going to hear about what people love about winter. I used to enjoy wearing long underwear. Now I have to wear a bikini. <laughs> what I love about winter is Minnesota winters, great cold sledding, snowboarding, cross-country skiing, ice skating, Ice fishing, making snow angels, but in the last three years, I've not been able to do this much because it's too warm. Do you have a name on that? Christine Carroll. So if you can introduce yourself as the reader, who's next? Mike? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was delegated. <clears throat> what I love about winter is the sound of my blades scraping the ice as Lake Calhoun belches and bubbles under my skates. Paul, 64. So I'm Kathy from Hayward. The muff what I love about winter is the muffled stillness that comes over the land, everything covered in a quiet, sparkling pillow of snow. From Liana, age 18. Thank you. And we'll read more in a moment or so. What, what we found in working with igniting the movement for a cooler climate is that people need to make global warming, climate change, our changing cl climate personal. When they see changes in their backyard, in their garden, 
it's a hard thing to just think about a melting ice cap and a polar bear because it's so far away. As skiers, we are an endangered species. And year after year, in my 32 years, I was always nervous, not just because could I make it to the finish line, but is the race going to happen? Is it a full course? What's it going to be like? So we now have this incredible opportunity to participate in probably humanity's greatest effort ever, you know, to slow climate change through community involvement. And today we're going to hear from the leader of the, really, the global climate movement in, in building, building a movement like the civil rights movement, but for every person. It's not just in our country. It's everywhere, because what we do here has an impact on what's happening in the Maldives and in Kiribati and in Tuvalu, where people are now beginning to move to higher ground. Uh, not only is Bill McKibben with us today, but we also have the honor of a no, wave two skater, Jonathan Patz from Madison. Jonathan is the director of the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He's also a member of the cross country uh, masters team in uh, Madison. He co-chaired the health panel of the US National Assessment on Climate Change. And he served as one of the lead authors for 15 years on the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. So he is a Nobel Peace Prize winner in 2007. Jonathan, come on up, please. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here and all the work that you've put together in the Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, I actually am not so vertically challenged by the ice, so it's, it's not so bad when I fall. <laughs> but um, it's really a, an honor to just uh, put the local perspective on this talk. I heard Bill McKibben give his awesome uh, talk in Madison a, a couple months ago, and uh, so it's really an honor to be here to talk about uh, climate change in Wisconsin before Bill McKibben uh, is going to give the, the, the main talk. Um, I've been part of the, um, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. This is a group that combines the um, Department of Natural Resources and the University of Wisconsin to look at what does climate change mean for our state and what are the climate forecasts. Um, let me, let me give you uh, some results that actually are quite worrisome. Uh, let's look back historically. Since 1950, the annual temperature for the state of Wisconsin has increased by one degree Fahrenheit. The winter temperature has increased two and a half degrees. And for northwest Wisconsin, since 1950, the temperatures have increased four and a half degrees Fahrenheit. What about the future? According to these climatologists, uh, looking at uh, Wisconsin, by the year 2050, which is not that far off, uh, Wisconsin could increase on average uh, four to nine degrees Fahrenheit. So that makes me worried for uh, the Berkey being an endangered uh, event. Uh, but there are things that we can do about this. And Bill McKibben, of course, is gonna talk about you know, why it's so important to, to mitigate, to reduce the pollution, the greenhouse gas pollution that's causing the problem. Uh, I work in public health, and I'll just tell you that uh, our research team has looked at the question, what if we were to have low carbon transportation for our state, or actually for the region? What if we could reduce car trips that are just two and a half miles? Uh, what would that mean for air pollution? Well, we run the, ran the numbers and found out that we'd save hundreds of lives every year, and $4 billion in avoided mortality and health costs because of cleaner air quality. Now, all of you here in the room, of course, are big athletes, I know. What if you were to take those short car trips and achieve them by bicycle? And only in the summertime, because we know, uh, you know, nowadays uh, you, know, you can get studded snow tires and those big fat snow bike tires and everything, but just, three months of the year, half of those 
car trips by bicycle, you would save another 700 lives every year. So, you know, even if climate change doesn't happen, which unfortunately it is, but even if, it, it, if it, the forecast is not as bad as, as the climatologists say it is, it's a great benefit to reduce our carbon emissions. We'd be saving lives and billion, billions of dollars. So uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, what's going on in Wisconsin and why these things matter here. They matter today. It's already warming, and the forecast is uh, for even accelerated warming. But to change our course in reducing fossil fuel uh, consumption, it's a win-win. It's a win-win for, for our, our, our livelihood and for our health. So, Paul, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about that. Is, this is your button for your race suit. Okay. And then we have some hats that say Cool Planet Skiers. And for your great work, we'd like you to have a hat. Wow. Okay. And then you got to go out and raise some money for us. Okay. So, white or black? I'll, I'll take, I'll take black. Thank you. Thanks. We just got these today. We took, our, we took our frisbee catching dog and we put skis and poles on the dog, as you can see on the poster with the number 350. How many know what 350 means out there? Yeah, someone want to yell it out? Parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, and science tells us, should we go above that? No, we need to stay below that. Are we above it now? Yeah, we're at about 394, 396, and it's going up a couple ppms uh, every year. So we need to do something about that. And so Cool Planet Skiers, which you can become part of that by wearing a button. We have strips for your race suit that we're working on now. We've got hats and we've got pledge kits. So you can go out even after the Berkey to talk to your friends about why climate change is important to you and how we need to build this movement through groups like 350.org, Citizens Climate Lobby, and getting our leaders to really listen to what it is that we're saying. So what we're saying now, Mindy, we're ready for three more. What do we love about winter? Well, that's a good idea. What I love about winter is walking in the woods and seeing evidence of those who walked before you, human and animal. Alyssa, age 21. What I love about winter is how the snow glistens like diamond flakes, making giant Scandinavian ice candles and hot cocoa after sledding with my son. From Carrie Ann, age 37, and I noticed she has a very cool email address, Green Warrior Bunny. The solitary quality I enjoy tracking animals in the fresh snow on my cross-country skis. Tom, age 83. Anybody else have a card? So we're going to post these. We've got a couple hundred of them now. We're posting them on our website. And we're going to continue to do this through the seasons because when we're not skiing, we're biking, we're paddling, we're doing something. So join us. Uh, today you'll have an opportunity to fill out an action card and we'll talk about that after Bill speaks but uh, it's so important that we connect the things that we love and that make us healthy to have a healthy engaged community with a healthy planet uh, besides uh, this we're also focusing on the Hayward cable area and any money that is raised here tonight 50 percent of that money will go to a special project to two of our sponsors, the Forest Lodge Library in Cable, the cutest library on the planet, and the Natural History Museum, which has how many solar panels? They have four. Can we get five or six? And then that energy from the sun is sent to the Forest Lodge Library to keep kids cool in the summer. So we're calling it Keeping Reading Cool. So that's a great way that we can 
support local projects as we build this local movement. And we have a board member here from the, uh, the Natural History Museum, uh, Ron Anderson. Can you come up? And he's a, he's a cool planet skier. We blocked off the way here. I'm sure the fire department is not too happy about that. Uh, and Ron will tell us a little bit about, about the museum. My name is Ron Anderson. I'm president of the board of the Cable Natural History Museum. We're a privately funded museum. Our mission is to connect people with nature in the North Woods to promote a sense of responsibility, wonder, and awe. And part of our responsibility is to uh, worry about climate change. We're seeing it every year. We, we keep uh, records of uh, a variety of things. Uh, the first robin appearing, and, and uh, snow uh, melting, ice outs on various lakes. And we can see over the last 100 years that winters are shorter and shorter and shorter. So our mission, we're very pleased to be a co-sponsor of this event. I'm very pleased uh, that uh, Cool Planet does contribute half of the fundraising uh, money to uh, the local uh, charities. The uh, Cable Natural History Museum, as I said, is privately funded, and the uh, public library does need an additional solar panel, so it will be off the grid in the summer. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. And Christine, are you here? Do you want to say anything? Thank you. And all of that without a microphone. We also want to thank Redberry, Redberry Books. Tomorrow night we'll be having pizza at the eatery, and then Bill will be signing uh, his book, Earth and Long Distance, the book that he wrote about training uh, as an Olympic athlete. Uh, so he will be at the Redberry Books uh, tomorrow. Pardon? Saturday. Did I say tomorrow? I just want the race to be over. <laughs> I'm going to rest tomorrow, so okay, I'm living in the past and the future. So uh, we, you're not here to listen to my jokes. You're here to, to hear from Bill and uh, to really open up your, your, not just your ears, but your heart to this message because it's a tough message. And, you know, there's something that all of us can do, and each one of us needs to take this message and be a leader out in our community. And that can start tonight and tomorrow. We have people right now at the Cable Museum that are listening on the live stream and people around the country and people around the world. Bill is communicating with the White House. He's communicating with people all over the world all the time. 50,000 people came to the National Mall last Sunday putting a stake in the ground and saying, climate change is not okay. We're going to do something about it. And we have to start and build this movement into the largest movement that humanity has ever seen. So my friend and Cool Planet skier, I'd like to introduce Bill McKibben from Ripton, Vermont. Yeah. Well, what a great, great pleasure is to be here. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be in this beautiful theater and to get to remember the Cable Natural History Museum where I got to spend a, a great night uh, uh, years ago speaking and to get to be on WOJB. 
Um, now, I listen to WOJB all the time um, at home in Vermont. Listen to it stream in, because you guys take it for granted. It's your local radio station. It's a great radio station. Really great. Um, but one of the days that I always make sure to listen to it is uh, the day of the Berkey. Because, you know, they interview everybody who comes across the line, and it's like the greatest uh, Midwest joke of all time, you know? <laughs> everybody who comes across, they, uh, how was it? It was good. Um, um, uh, you're going to do it again, y'all be here next year. That's all I'm, So if they interview me, when I, I'm going to be like, that was horrible, man. This, I'm in agony. This, I mean, I mean, uh, it was good. It was good. It, it was, it's so, WOJB is a tremendous, tremendous outfit. I'm also really happy that News from Indian Country is um, um, watching this tonight. You know, as we've, and I'll talk about these battles we've been engaged in in the last couple of years that have gotten more dramatic and uh, around the country and sending us all to jail and so on and so forth. But our greatest allies, the people really leading this fight, have been indigenous Americans on either side of the border. And it's been, <clears throat> you know, enormous, enormous fun, uh, enormous fun to get, you know, Winona LaDuke, my old, old friend and college classmate, has, you know, been helping enormously. But all kinds of people, the Indigenous Environmental Network, Tom Goldtooth and Clayton Thomas Muller and uh, 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 Marty Cobanez and uh, Gitz Crazy Boy and all the people up in Canada uh, uh, along the Pacific Coast who stopped the, uh, uh, the pipeline that would have gone to the Pacific, Reuben George and Jackie Thomas and Melina Lubicon Massimo and uh, 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 Crystal Lehman who spoke uh, the other day in D.C., and uh, Tom Poorbear, and Deborah Whiteplume, and just an enormous number of people who have been absolutely stalwart, and, and, and uh, uh, well, there's just never any doubt that they will come through and, and always come through, and um, um, great fun to get to work with them. Look, winter is my favorite time of year, and for the reasons Paul says, you know, for a little while, um, friction lets go its hold on the planet, and, and, and you can sort of, I mean, you're not bound down and stuck to the earth the way you are the rest of the time, you know, all of a sudden, uh, uh, you're easily in motion, and, and, and I love that, um, and I love the kind of sense of rest that comes with the winter too, you know, the way that the, the kind of, well, at this latitude, or where I live anyway, the kind of short, feverish summer, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a little too busy and energetic for me, just out there in the natural world, everything spawning and procreating and, you know, dying, it's amazing, all the, well, it just sort of everything goes on hold for a while, it's nice, you know. Um, 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 in fact, if you think about it, really, I, th I assume here, certainly in Vermont, um, winter's kind of the default season. There's really more winter than there is anything else. There's more days of the year with leaves off the trees than leaves on, you know. And so it's, uh, if you didn't like it, if you didn't love it, this would be the wrong place to be. You should go join all those unhappy souls down in Florida doing whatever it is they do down there, you know. <laughs> Um, um, and that's why, I mean, I have, I can tell you an endless number of good reasons why we should be fighting climate change, and I will, and I'll tell you about the people I've met around the world and the suffering I've seen, and, uh, and I confess that sometimes for me the single biggest reason is just that um, I love winter so much, and it's a shame to see it disappear. In our region, the EPA did the first of their big global climate change sort of reporting forecasts a couple of years ago, and buried in the appendix of this thing, there was a note that said, uh, by mid-century mid in northern New England, snowmobiling and cross-country skiing will be extinct, was the word they used. And that just made me extraordinarily sad to read, um, and one more reason to, to fight. Um, what Jonathan said was true. We're really already well into uh, this thing we call climate change. 
I wrote the first book about all this 24 years ago now. Um, and at the time, it was still a future threat, you know? We didn't, we, we were, this is going to be bad and here's what it's gonna look like. But nobody thought, none of the scientists, that it was going to be this bad this quickly. If you had told people 24 years ago, even the most pessimistic scientists, what 2012 would have looked like, they wouldn't have believed you. We shattered the old record for the hottest year in America. We broke it by a full degree, which if you know anything about statistics, should have been completely impossible to do, you know? But there it was. And you'll recall sort of the scenes from that year, that bizarre, bizarre sort of summer in March um, with temperatures up in the 80s, in the Dakotas, temperatures in the 90s before the end of winter. Um, um, you know, every flowering thing in bloom, weeks, months prematurely, and then the summer that turned into this horrific drought um, uh, uh, across the richest farmland in the world, and then come autumn, our uh, our greatest city, our 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 you know world city. Um, um, with the Atlantic Ocean pouring into the subway system. Uh, uh, you know, a kind of totemic reminder of just how fragile civilization suddenly is in the face of what we have unleashed. The truth is, when people look back in 50 years, though, those aren't the things they'll remember about 2012. The one thing that the world will remember is that it was the summer that the Arctic really finally melted. It was, uh, 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 it was, incredible to watch this past summer. If you were paying attention, watching the satellite data, day after day we broke, uh, by, by mid-August, with six weeks still to go in the Arctic summer, we broke the old record for minimum ice extent, and then it just kept melting and melting and melting. It wasn't just the sea ice, Greenland was melting at a ferocious rate. There were days this summer when all the whole ice sheet of Greenland all the way up to the summit, high, high, high up was melting all at once, something we hadn't seen before. Um, um, yesterday there was a new data set released from the people at Cryosat and they said um, there's only about 20, there's only about a fifth of the ice left in the summer Arctic that was there 40 years ago. So when Neil Armstrong looked down from the moon at the Arctic, he saw five times more ice than there is now. That is to say, we took one of the biggest physical features on Earth and we broke it. And other ones are following right behind. I mean, the oceans are now about 30% more acidic than they were 40 years ago because the chemistry of seawater changes as it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. The oceans are our metaphor for bigness, you know. It's bizarre to think that we're able to affect their chemistry in such short order, but we are. Uh, here on land, the thing that we notice most is the um, change in hydrology, the change in the way that water moves around the earth. If you want one thing to bear in mind, to understand the 21st century, it's that warm air holds more water vapor than cold. So the atmosphere is about 5% wetter already, all right? Um, that means that the dice is fully loaded for more drought and for more flood. It can and does rain a lot harder than it used to. We found this out in Vermont two, a year and a half ago in September of 2011, when Hurricane Irene veered around New York City and all the guys on CNN were going, oh, this storm has fizzled and whatever. And it came up to Vermont and dumped absolutely record amounts of rain, far more than we had ever seen before. And, you know, covered bridges that had stood there for 150 years, taking everything nature could throw at them were just washed away down rivers. We lost 500 miles of state highway in a very small state. We lost like 20 bridges. It was the biggest thing that's ever happened there, and something like it's happening someplace around the world now every day. I mean, last week it was Mozambique had flooding like they'd never seen before. 200,000 people displaced from their homes, you know. 
uh, 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 next week it'll be someplace else. Um, everything that I'm describing is what happens when you raise the temperature of the earth one degree. That's how much we've raised it so far. Okay? But the same scientists who told us that would happen are confident in their prediction that unless we get our act together fast, unless we get off coal and oil and gas far faster than anyone's now planning to, any government's now planning to, that one degree will be four or five degrees before the kids who skied in the Barna Berkey today are, you know, the age of some of us in this room. Um, um, and if we let it warm like that, then all bets are off. Um, I mean, we're going to have a hard time dealing with one degree, and we're almost certain to get, even if we do everything right, pretty close to two degrees, because there's a lot of momentum in this system. But if we let it go up three, four, five degrees, we can't have civilizations like the ones we have. A couple of years ago, a team of agronomists at Stanford and the University of Washington just studied the question, what happens to grain yields uh, if it gets hot like that? And they concluded that from this point on, each degree increase in global average temperature should cut grain yields about 10%. All right? And you get a good sense of how easily that could happen watching Iowa this past summer. You know, it grew less corn than it's grown in 30 years. Yields were, even despite all the fancy seeds and fertilizers and pesticides and combines, I mean, it just, when it's that hot and there's no rain, you can't grow things. And, 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 and so try to imagine the temperature goes up two or three degrees and the food supply goes down 20 or 30 percent. Try to imagine, well, you guys all know enough about this planet to be able to do kind of the mental calculation in your head. What happens to our Earth with 20% fewer calories? Nothing good, you know. Um, um, the kind of destabilization and strife and horror that that represents would be, already is beginning to be the biggest thing that's ever happened on this planet. And we can't let it progress any farther. We just can't. We've got to figure out how to bring it under control. So that's the only thing I really want to talk about is how to bring it under control. And I'll do it as quick as I can. The good news is that we really know how to do it now. Um, um, 20 years ago, environmentalists talked about renewable energy with their fingers crossed a little bit. Because it wasn't, you know, it was still like, you know, uh, sort of ex-hippies down in the basement with, uh, you know, lead acid batteries trying to, you know, it's sort of... A, more power to them. They were the pioneers. But now it couldn't be easier, you know. Now the library goes out to the home supply store and gets a solar panel and puts it on the roof. The one country that took this really seriously is Germany. In Germany, there were, well, the one large, the one non Scandinavian country that's taken this seriously. Um, and uh, the Germans have done so much work that, that there were days this past summer when Germany generated more than half the electricity it used from solar panels within its borders, okay? And this is Germany. I mean, Munich is north of Montreal. It's kind of foggy, Wagnerian sort of place, you know? Uh, it's not Texas and Cal you know, California and Arizona and Florida or whatever. It's hard there, and yet the point is that, that um, it's not a lack of technology. It's a lack of political will to do something. About it. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I really understood that a couple of years ago when I was in China doing a piece for National Geographic about China and energy. And one of the things, you know, China has lots of problems, obviously. They emulated us in too many ways, building coal-fired power plants. But they also lead the world in renewable energy. Um, one of the things you notice when you go there is that in many cities, there's these solar hot water heaters on almost every roof. Um, about 25% of Chinese get their hot water from the sun. So 250 million people. In this country, the number's less than 1%, and most of that's used to heat swimming pools. Okay? But, so I spent a day with the guy who run the biggest of these companies, uh, Huang Ming, he's called He Min Solar. And, you know, we, show, we spend all day talking about solar panels. He's an engineer, but now a very rich engineer. And, he uh, took me into his private museum to show me his, 
you know, and his pictures of him with famous people and things. But the pride of place in this museum is this old rusting solar panel. He says, do you know what that is? No, what is that? Oh, that's one of the solar panels that Jimmy Carter put on the White House in 1979, all right, and Ronald Reagan took down in 1985, because you know, he wanted manlier forms of energy, you know, than that. And, 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 and it really just hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, we knew how to do a lot of this stuff 40 years ago, you know, um, 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 and we don't do it only because, only because the power of the fossil fuel industry to block this transition is so enormous. After 25 years of looking at this, that's the main conclusion in a sense that I've almost come to. We thought for the longest time that, you know, reason would prevail here. All the world scientists trot up every year to Capitol Hill and say, the worst thing that ever happened in the world is happening. You know, all the economists come right after them, say, here's what we need to do about it. You know, modest price on carbon rises over the years, things get better, so on and so forth. But nothing ever happened. We won the argument 15 years ago, but we've lost the fight. And the reason is that reason is not what's at issue here. It's power. And these guys have all of it because they have all the money. And, and, and when I say all money, I mean, this is the richest industry in history by far. Exxon made more money last year than any company in the history of money, okay? Um, 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 and I... Finally, this past year, really got a sense of uh, a better sense of exactly what was going on. I wrote a piece that was in Rolling Stone in the summer, a piece that went strangely viral. It was funny. It was for those of you who keep your back issues. It was the one with Justin Bieber on the cover. Okay, and um, um, but the weird thing was, the editor called me the next day and said, this is strange, but your piece has 10 times as many likes on Facebook as Justin Bieber's. And, uh, you know, partly my soulful stare, you know, but, but, um, but, but mostly it sort of was just about the kind of new and really um, pointed math about climate change. There were three numbers in the piece. One is two degrees. That's the red line that the world has drawn for how much we can let the temperature go up. It's actually much too high. If one degree melts the Arctic, we're fools to find out what two degrees would do. But we're going to go there. Um, um, the only thing the world's ever agreed on, when they had that failed climate conference in Copenhagen, they ended up with this like scrawled out two-page piece of paper uh, that had no commitments or targets or enforcement mechanism. But it did, everybody did sign to say, Two degrees is as much as we should let the planet warm. Okay, so it's the first number. Second number, also we've known for a while, 565 gigatons worth of carbon. That's about how much more we can pour into the atmosphere and have some realistic hope of staying below two degrees. At the rate we're burning things now, it'll take us about 15 years to reach that level. So that's bad news. But the scary number was the third number, and it was the reason I wrote the piece a team of financial analysts in the UK had done the work. Is there some, some can I get a glass of water somehow? I'm just beginning to, uh, uh, it's been, I've been talking all day. I just talk, talk, talk. Um, 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 they did the work, they went through all the SEC filings and annual reports and so on and so forth. And they calculated how much carbon the fossil fuel industry had in its reserves. And that number turned out to be 2,795 gigatons, five times more than the most conservative governments on Earth say would be safe to burn. Thank you against very much. The laws of the state, they get to write those mostly, but outlaw against the laws of physics, you know. Their business plan involves tanking the planet, and you can't have a healthy business plan and a healthy planet for these guys. Those are mutually exclusive possibilities. The other thing you understood was why they fought so hard to make sure that nothing ever happened in Washington or many other capitals, you know, because this is what their wealth depends on. 
Um, so the question is, how do you work around that? And the only answer that I've ever been able to come up with is, and I, you know, remember, I'm not an organizer or an activist or anything by trade or by um, inclination. I mean, I'm a writer by inclination. Left to my own devices, I mean, it's nice to be here with you, but I'd rather be home typing, you know, that's what I like to do. Stuck in my room, you know. Um, but, since we're never going to outspend the fossil fuel industry, our only recourse is to come up with some other currencies to work in. Not money, because we're outspent but the currencies of movements, passion, spirit, creativity. Sometimes we've got to spend our bodies, you know. And that's what we've been working on for the last few years. We founded this thing, 350.org, in 2008, January 2008, so just over five years ago. And when I say we, I mean me and seven undergraduates at Middlebury College in Vermont, where I teach a little bit, and where my main role is uh, as uh, faculty advisor to the Nordic ski team. <laughs> they, they don't actually need much advice, it must be said. They have a good coach, and they're, you know, uh, 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 excellent uh, skiers and human beings, but uh, it means I get to go root for them at, at ski races and things. But um, once the ski season was over, uh, uh, these seven kids and I set out to form this thing, 350.org. And we took the odd name mostly because we wanted to work globally. We had this number that Jim Hansen at NASA had just provided that Paul explained to you about parts per million in the atmosphere. And we figured this is good because though people speak different languages, Arabic numerals always work, you know. So 350 will mean the same thing, you know, no matter... Well, where we are around the world, Hayward or Hanoi, you know, 350 will, will, will look the same. And, um, and so we set off to work. There were seven students, there are seven continents, each one of them took one. Um, um, the guy who took the Antarctic also had to take the internet, you know, and, and, <laughs> and we set off to try and organize the world. And uh, we have some pictures up there slides that you can just flip through the, some of those slides. I just want you to see, those of you who work on this stuff, what your brothers and sisters around the world look like. These are from these great global, just sort of flip randomly through them as you go. These great global days of action that we've put together all over the world. Um, CNN's called it the most widespread political activity in the planet's history. We've had four of these days and about 5,200 Oh, but now about 15,000 demonstrations in every country on earth except North Korea. Um, and one of the things you'll notice as you go through, I'd always heard, oh, environmentalism is something for rich white people who have their other problems taken care of. If you worried where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist, you know. Um, um, it just turns out that's not true. Most of the people that we work with around the world are poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that's what most of the world is composed of. That's the head of Muslim South Africa, of indigenous traditions, the Anglican Archbishop, at the head of a big multi-faith march, you know, across uh, 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 Cape Town. Um, that's our biggest evangelical college, Billy Graham's alma mater, you know. Um, the next one, that's... that's our friends in Jordan and Palestine and Israel along the shores of the Dead Sea uh, are working together on one of these projects. Um, you can even flip through them faster because they're just, and sort of, and we have thousands, tens of thousands of these um, 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 from all over the world and they're beautiful to look at and uh, uh, and just to look at them always reminds me of all the friends now all over the planet. There were, there are a big file just called 350 Adorable, you know. And they are adorable and they're also hard to look at. Those girls will be refugees before they're middle-aged, you know. Um, that's those seven kids. Um, um, but 
as we, um, there should be more of them there. Just, it's fine to just keep showing them and I'll just, won't even talk about them. Just, uh, just show them. Um, as we do this work, all right, this work of great work of global education, even as we're kind of winding up to do it, this problem just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and more and more, you know, uh, 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 trouble keeps erupting, you know. Our friends in Pakistan have the greatest rainstorm ever there and 20 million people are displaced from their homes. Um, um, we have huge and horrific droughts across Africa. Uh, we begin to see sea level rise doing people in and place after place after place. Um, um, and we begin to feel the need, and it's a powerful need. That's, speaking of Cool Planet, that's the, all the bike mechanics in Auckland who then fanned out and just went into people's garages and things and repaired their bikes for them one day so that they would have no excuse not to be riding to work, you know. <laughs> Um, 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 at a certain point, we decided education, not enough. We're losing this fight. We've got to engage. We've got to actually resist. We've got to go to work. And so that's what the last couple of years have mostly been about. That's as good a place as any just to stop and hold it there for a while, just because it's such a good sign for Paul's efforts at cool planet with all those people on bikes all over the place. Two years ago, 18 months ago or so, Jim Hansen at NASA put out another one of these reports. And the report was about the tar sands in Canada. He said, huh, those tar sands in Canada have a lot of carbon in them. If you burned everything in Alberta tomorrow, which you, I, hopefully you can't do it all in one night, but if you could, the atmospheric concentration of carbon would go from 395 parts per million to 540 parts per million, just from Alberta. I mean, that, that alone would be enough to break the planet. Um, and, and that was an interesting thing to read because right at the moment that we were reading it, news came of this plan for a big pipeline down out of the tar sands, a Keystone XL pipeline to go down to the Gulf of Mexico export all this oil overseas someplace, you know. And news came also that for a kind of strange set of legal reasons, the president himself was going to be able to make the decision about whether or not to grant the permit for this thing. Because it crosses a national border, there's a law that says he has to declare it in the national interest or not. Uh, it's a law that mostly used to apply to like bridges between Maine and New Brunswick and you know stuff like that. But in this case, it came into play. And so we decided that we would try and take this thing on. Even though everybody said it was a done deal and there was no chance of blocking it, we decided we would try. Um, that it was just too much at stake. And so we set to work. And, and the way that we went to work was, um, well, first, since no one knew about it, we decided we'd need to use the power of, of, of civil disobedience um, to make people focus on it. And we asked people to come to Washington in the summer of 2011 and, and go to jail. And they did. 1,253 people were arrested over two weeks, and that was the largest civil disobedience action about anything in 30 years. It was very civil, civil disobedience. Um, we couldn't have been more civil and more polite. We were to the president. Uh, we were outside his house and we were trying, to, but we, every sign that we carried and everything else was just a sort of quote from Barack Obama, you know, and all we were saying was we want you to live up to what you said you were going to do. We trust you and we know you will. And, and the president looked at all that and he said, okay, we'll postpone this for a year while we do more study. Um, and some people said that was cynical because the year would take him past the election, you know. But you got to take people at face value when they do and say things, you know. And, and, and so, okay, we spent the last year in study. And Mother Nature, you know, filed the most compelling public testimony you could have asked for. That was that record warm year 
with all those disasters in it. But that's not enough to make sure that the thing won't get built. In fact, again, all the inside wise people are saying, oh, it's going to get built. Why is it going to get built? Because that oil up there that would add all that carbon to the atmosphere, its market value is probably three or four trillion dollars. And that creates a kind of pressure on systems, you know, um, um, that's hard to stop. But we are trying with everybody's help. There are people in this room who went to Washington last week for this rally, and it was a tremendous rally. Uh, it was the biggest rally about climate change ever in this country. There were 50,000 people on a bitter cold day. Uh, the people from Minnesota and Wisconsin were almost the only people who looked reasonably comfortable out there on the mall, you know. Um, 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 everybody else, was, but they all stood there. Uh, 50,000 were, there was nobody there by accident, I tell you. Um, and it was beautiful and exciting to see uh, uh, them all there and see that this movement finally, that the kind of antibodies are beginning to kick in, you know, that the fever... God knows if we've done it in time, but at least the fight is on, and that was really good to see. And to have speaker after speaker say this keystone thing is the litmus test. And if you all would um, write your senators and tell them, if you all would call the White House and say you're paying attention to this keystone thing, it would help. We don't know how it's going to go, and it'll be decided pretty soon, probably. Um, but it'll be decided not on the basis of reason. We won that argument long ago. It'll be decided on the basis of who they fear more. Um, this movement of people arising or the power of the fossil fuel industry. It was a little disappointing to learn yesterday that President Obama, while we were out there on the mall, had been golfing in Florida with oil company executives, you know. But maybe he was telling them, oh, sorry, can't do the pipeline, uh, you know, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll find out, I guess. Um, one of the things we learned during that Keystone stuff was that you could stand up to this industry. Hard, but you could do it. Another thing we learned is it's really hard, so we're probably not going to beat global warming one pipeline at a time. There's just too many of them, you know. We got to play defense against bad ideas. There's always people with a new bad idea. I was just learning about this plan up in Ashland for a new big coal-fired power plant to run a new big mine of some kind and so on. There's always stuff like that that one has to try and keep from happening. But nobody ever won anything playing defense, you know. We also got to figure out how to go on offense against this industry. And so that's what we've been trying to do. That was really the reason I wrote that article in Rolling Stone about those numbers. Because we hoped, after we knew about them, that we could try and spark a campaign that really took on this industry, that helped people understand that these companies deserve to lose their sort of social license, as it were, that they needed to be treated the way we treated the tobacco companies, uh, you know, at some point. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Philip Morris was a respectable company, and I'm old enough to remember when, if you'd walked into a theater like this, you would have seen it would have been a cloud of smoke that would have come out when the door opened, you know. Um, um, and that didn't happen anymore because people took down, you know, the reputation and the power of this. So we went around the country in November, uh, 24 cities in 26 nights, I think, playing big concert halls, doing a, a lecture tour. We, I mean, it was kind of fun in its weird way. We, um, we got a bus, a biodiesel bus. We got Johnny Cash's old bus driver. Um, and we drove, you know, we had bunks on the bus. We went around. And night after night, these big, big, you know, 3,000-seat houses sold out houses. And it was, it, was, it was good. And the reason it was good was because it served to spark a movement that all of a sudden has blown up out of nowhere to become the biggest student movement in decades. Uh, as of today, there are 256 college campuses now in this country where people are demanding that their trustees sell their fossil fuel stock, divest from fossil fuels. Um, and it's... 
it's incredibly exciting to see that and to see it spreading. In, you know, they're now Seattle just sold all, divested all its fossil fuel stocks. So it's spreading to governments. Religious denominations are getting heavily involved and starting to divest. It's exciting to see this beginning to happen, to sort of go on the offensive a little bit. And we need you to help with this too. There's probably people here um, who went to college and graduated from college. And if you did, you know that your college still has an interest in you. Uh, and they send you an envelope almost every year, you know, um, um, in hopes you'll put something in it. And, and one of the things you should put in it is a little note saying, um, I want to be completely proud of my alma mater, um, get out of fossil fuel stock uh, and do it soon, thanks to the kids who are leading this fight. Um, and other people figure out all kinds of other ways to do this same sort of thing. It's not that we're going to bankrupt Exxon, we're not, but we're going to take away some of that political power. We're going to weaken them some so that there's some hope of reason having a fighting chance, you know, in Washington and elsewhere. Um, I've rattled on a long time, so let me stop rattling and finish off so everybody can go get enough sleep before the race. Um, two things stick in my mind from those arrests in Washington 18 months ago um, that I'll tell you about just quickly as I finish. One of them is that when I wrote the letter, asked people to come get arrested, um, one of the things I said was, I do not think college students should have to be the cannon fodder here for this sort of thing. Look, if you're 22 right now in our economy, you might want to think twice about getting an arrest record, okay? One of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is, past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know? Um, 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 and, and so we, we kept... I'm now here regularly from people who say, this is on my bucket list, you know? Uh, 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 um, it was really fun to see people coming to D.C. Uh, who had sort of hairlines like mine. Now, we did not say to people, how old are you? Because that would be rude. But we said, cleverly, uh, who was president when you were born? <laughs> and the two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. Okay? Uh, on the last day, there was a guy arrested. With, he had a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet handle with care. And, <laughs> He'd been born in the Warren-Harding administration, which was so long ago I'd frankly forgotten there was a Warren-Harding <laughs> administration, you know. Um, 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 so that was good. I mean, elders are starting to act like elders, and that's appropriate here, and we need it to happen a lot. Um, second thing was, we told everybody, come get arrested. Put on a necktie or wear a dress, okay? Not because, I mean, I, you know, my sense is where I live in Vermont may be a little like Hayward, like basically we just sort of swaddle ourselves in fleece and make it through the winter, you know, and that's, you know, about it. Um, we don't really wear a lot of neckties and things, but we wanted to make a visual point. And the point was, and it's the same point I've been trying to make all night, there's nothing radical about what we're talking about, not a damn thing. Um, 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 all we're asking for is a world that works a little bit like the one we're used to, a world that when it comes around to February in northern Wisconsin, one can count on it being cold and snowing, you know? One can count on the lakes freezing. One can count, one doesn't have to sit there and worry like I bet Jonathan does, that it didn't get cold enough to kill off the ticks so the Lyme disease is going to be coming through. One where the moose aren't wandering around with 70,000 ticks burrowed into them and so their population dropping like a stone, you know. Uh, uh, all we want is a world like the one that we kind of knew for the last 10,000 years, the Holocene. And that's not a radical request, that's a conservative request. Okay. Um, 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 <laughs> radicals, radicals, frankly, work at oil companies. At this point, if you're willing to get up and make a big fortune every day by altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere, knowing full well now what it's accomplishing, then you're engaged in a more radical act than any human being that came before you. And it's our job to figure out how to rein in that radicalism before it wrecks every good thing on this good earth, you know. 
Uh, I don't know if we'll... Um, I don't know if we'll manage to do it. I mean, I don't know a lot of things. I don't know whether I'm actually going to manage to make it through 54 kilometers on <laughs> Saturday. I've spent more time in jail than I have training this <laughs> year, you know. Uh, uh, so... So if you pass me, you know, at some point, just, you know, uh, uh, give me a pat on the back and a sympathetic, you know. I don't know whether we started in enough time to deal with climate change. Um, 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 it's going to be close at best, you know. Um, and there's an awful lot of money on the other side, and maybe we can't win, but we can try, and we're going to try. You've seen pictures of people all over the world who are willing and eager and able to try, but most of them are in places where they can't actually affect the outcome. They live in countries where they don't burn enough fossil fuel to matter. They don't have the headquarters of big oil companies. They can't get on the bus and get to Washington to the capital of the only superpower in the world, you know. Uh, Barack Obama will pay no attention if he gets a phone call from them, you know, but he will if it comes from you. Um, I know that we're going to fight, and that's enough. Um, uh, 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 you know, I mean, uh, that's, you know, I mean, if nothing else, it's sort of, um, it's sort of one's, you know, duty to try and do it. If the worst thing that ever happened in the world happens to be happening while you're alive, then what choice do you have to do but go out and try to do something about it? And it'll be, um, it'll be a pleasure to do it shoulder to shoulder with you all. Many, many thanks. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. If you could sit down for just a moment. Uh, we have another amazing story to tell you, and that's about a gentleman that's here in the front row. To train for his Berkey, he biked here from Minneapolis. Uh, Steve Clark, he did it last year. Maybe not Minneapolis, but 100 miles. He biked. He came up a day early to this year so he could get a little bit of rest. So we are now passing around pencils for you to fill out your action card. Whether you live in Hayward or whether you live in Hanoi, we would like you to consider being a Cool Planet skier. So tomorrow, if you're interested in joining us by wearing a button or a hat or taking home uh, a pledge kit and getting your friends not just to contribute money but actually to contribute uh, your time and your energy to form a local program uh, we ask you to join join us you can also talk to the Berkey office and let them know that next year you would really like to see the cool planet skiers be an official part they were supportive this year but we need more attention because people only are here fi finding out about it here tonight thanks to WOJB. So we're asking you for your contributions tonight. Uh, if you can fill out your card, that's great. If you can contribute some money, put it in the basket. Uh, half of your money will go to put solar panels on the cable museum and for the library. And if you're interested in joining us, uh, there are a number of things on the card. You can be a Cool Planet skier. You can contact your state and federal legislators. You can start a citizen climate lobby group. This year, we're going to be going to Washington, D.C. We, we invited Sean Duffy to come tonight. He sent back, he sent back uh, a message from his office saying that he was busy. But we want him to know that the economic viability of the community where he grew up depends upon a snowfall winter. So we're working to build bridges between Republicans and Democrats. And as of last week, after the rally, uh, Brian Novak, 
the young man back there with a the lovely white beard, he met with Eric Paulson's aide, and there is now a group of eight Republicans that are working together to talk about a carbon tax. Yes. And last week, last week, Barbara Boxer and Bernie Sanders introduced legislation called Fee and Dividend, which would put a rising fee on the burning of fossil fuels and give the money back to American families to make good decisions on driving forward renewable energy, conservation programs. So we need to make this a program that's based in the market so that Republicans and Democrats can work together. So this group is all over the country. If you check the box that says Citizen Climate Lobby, we will connect you with the group, whether it's in Madison, whether it's in the Twin Cities, Chicago. We have over 70 groups, and we'll be meeting with all 535 offices in June, uh, and you can go to D.C. and be a citizen lobbyist because we don't get paid for what we do, and we pay their salary. So they need to listen to us. So please consider that. Form a green team, uh, make a contribution, and then fill out the card. We'll put you on our mailing list and we'll support you in being a climate leader in your country. So tonight, give us some money, get a button. If you want to, and you're not a skier, you can have one of these and just be cheering. Cool planet, join us. Be a cool planet skier. So come up and get one of these and help us spread the word. We'll be all over the place tomorrow, but we're a small group. We got about 10 of us. We'd like to get our numbers up to 100. So does anyone have any questions for Bill? And Mindy, could you pass the microphone while we pass the baskets? Any questions for Bill? Over here we have two. Um, I'm a little skeptical of how Barack Obama is going to come down on uh, Keystone. Um, are there any plans of, uh, or any thoughts of uh, mass exodus to the Green Party? Political analyst, uh, but my sense is that uh, probably that's not how most people are going to spend their time in the next little while. Um, one of the things that climate change does, because it's happening so fast, is kind of force you to figure out how to work with what you've got instead of what you'd like to have. So, like, you know. I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, but maybe it would be easier to solve this problem if we all belong to some like nature-based religion or something. But I don't think we're going to in a, in a time period that's relevant. And maybe if we had some other economic system that I don't even know what it would be, but maybe that'd be easier. But my guess is we're gonna have markets in the relevant period of time, and hence we better figure out how to make sure markets help not hurt, and so on and so forth. I think we got probably going to be working in this country with a two-party system in the relevant period of time, so we better figure out how to put as much pressure on it as we can. But, uh, you know, it's quite possible that he'll do the wrong thing. Fire away. Just shout. I'll repeat. And I read in a book recently that the insurance companies that insure people against weather-related problems and flooding and all, they get this. Yes. So I wonder if you could just address whether, and they have a lot of money, I think, and they... Yes, they have some, anyway. The problem, I mean, yes, the insurance industry definitely gets it because they're the part of our economy we ask to analyze risk, and they're good at it. And if you think about it, the climate change is a huge problem for the insurance industry and really for the, all the rest of us as a result. One of the three or four great human inventions that really made modern life possible was the invention of the actuarial table, okay? 
um, it allows you to hedge risk. And without the ability to do that, people wouldn't make sort of investments and put, you know, we couldn't do much of what we do. It's a great technology, the actuarial table. The only flaw in it is it basically requires the world to work in the future more or less as it worked in the past, all right? And if you screw that up, then that whole system of hedging risk begins to get screwed up too. So yeah, the insurance industry is very worried. The trouble here mostly is that there's lots of industries that know that there's a problem and would like sort of something to be done about it. It's just that none of them are as focused on getting that done as the fossil fuel industry is on making sure that it doesn't get done. Because if you own a coal mine or an oil well, then if we ever do anything seriously about this, then you're out of luck, okay? What we have to do is put enough regulation, make a change, put price on carbon, so that people like Exxon make the basic decision, huh, we better stop being fossil fuel companies and start being energy companies. And if they did, then we'd get someplace. Exxon alone, one company, spends $100 million a day looking for new hydrocarbons. That's their research budget, even though we have five times more than any sane person says we could burn, all right? If they were spending $100 million a day putting up solar panels, we would not be having to, like, raise money to put them on the roof of the library. You know, they'd just be there. That's what we would do, you know? So, so uh, yeah, we need, uh, 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 I think, until we make this political leap and change the rules of the game enough, we're not going to get where we need to go. But when we do, it may come more quickly than we, uh, you know, dare hope in certain ways. Do we have time for one more, Paul? All right. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. I want to. I want to do a call out. I want to commend you. Um, number one, you you definitely match uh, Justin Bieber's stare, but he's kind of he's got you in the hair department. Mm. But um, such is life. Anyway, uh, there's a in the current Rolling Stones issue. There's an article uh, interviewing Al Gore, and he makes mention of you for your pioneering spirit in uh, addressing global change or global warming decades ago. And uh, I want to thank you for that, as uh, was mentioned by Mr. Gore. Also, in our area up here, we have a lot of uh, fracking sand mm. mining. Mm. And I'm wondering where you are as we're seeing uh, this byproduct or this resource being mined locally, very locally here, where you are on the whole... Uh, fracking uh, industry. So I wrote a long piece for the New York Review of Books about fracking, and I will summarize it briefly. We've spent a lot of time trying to fight fracking, and the reason is that it's not a good solution to climate change. It's claims of its proponents to the contrary. Um, natural gas does produce less carbon than coal when you burn it, but there are two troubles. One, natural gas when you don't burn it, i.e. when it leaks, which it does a lot, it's called CH4 or methane. And the molecular structure of CH4 is even more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So if the leakage rate exceeds two or three percent, then natural gas turns out to be worse than coal for climate change. Second reason, even if you could do it without leaking anything at all, you'd still be causing more trouble than it's worth because cheap natural gas is undercutting wind power more quickly than it's undercutting coal. And so it's, it's like a fad diet. We get a little bit of a reduction at the cost of ever rearranging our lives in a way that would actually make us healthy. Um, what we need to do is move swiftly to actual renewable energy and off carbon energy and fracking is just getting in the way. And it is just one more of the endless ramifying horrors of all of this that in order to do it, we also have to dig up uh, you know, northern Wisconsin and Minnesota to get this sand to put on it. There are just times when you, one just, you know, sort of looks at things like the tar sands and stuff or and just thinks, what are we thinking, really? Um, you know, I mean, uh, 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 I mean, think about solar power, right? If something goes wrong, if we have a solar spill, we call it a sunny day, you know? Um, 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 uh, it's just, I mean, it's so obvious where we need to go and what we need to do. 
Yes, I see one more out there. So Mr. McKibben, you sound distressed about the global warming situation. Am I wrong? <laughs> I think most people in this room feel distressed about it. Now, I think we need a weapon, and I think it's, we need to take the gloves off. Now, George Bush stated this just before he went into Afghanistan and in Iraq, <clears throat> two countries that did nothing to us. And what did he do? He did a very symbolic move for the American people, which we are very symbolic people. Mm. I'm not saying simple, I'm saying symbolic. Mm. And what did he do? He took a 14 karat gold American flag and he pinned it on his left lapel. That cost us $3 trillion. Nobody's ever going to know how many lives. Okay, July 7th, 1976, the United States Congress passed, put into law, the Flag Act, which states that any American can fly a flag on your house, on your hat, on your car, upside down. It just means distress. It just means, this, but it's the most powerful weapon we have. So it's time to take the gloves off. And it could be the very first nonviolent revolution of the world. And I would ask you, sir, to use this as a logo in the future. All There's right. no stronger weapon we have. Noted. And it's nonviolent. Noted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very, very much, uh, and uh, enjoy the trail. <laughs>